Cam, uh, I was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit more again about that uh, that article. That's uh, so you're in the Vancouver Island Free Daily. Um, was that today? I didn't see the dateline on the on the story. Yeah, but... I believe it may have been posted. Some of them posted last night or perhaps this morning. And uh, yeah, they could have picked up on uh, the release that you're having this presentation today. And so hopefully uh, get some people in from uh, local Vancouver Island folks who join be joining us. That's great. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of small town journalism. So big props to them for for getting it. Very cool. Yeah. How does it feel to be to be famous? To be <laughs> <laughs> well, as I sit here in my opposite home, it doesn't I don't feel famous, but uh, it's certainly it's uh, yeah, interesting to see your face and then your name in the paper. I guess so. It's <laughs> nice to have your friends and family who message you saying I saw you online. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Right. And so, sorry, go ahead, Alindra. You can. Uh, I was just going to ask, how's how is the weather where you are right now? Ah, uh, it's quite nice. It's a beautiful sunny day here, and uh, you know, it's as I'll talk about a little later. I'm you know down down in Hawaii here, a nice sun, nice sunny day, and uh, it's quite warm. I'm not sure if you can see it. I have a little thermometer in here. It's currently 30 degrees in the office right now. So if I start sweating. I'll hopefully that's the camera doesn't pick that up, but uh, <laughs> a little, little bit warm here today. It's summertime in August here. So I'll, I'll power through here. I, I don't think, I don't imagine that we can see if you're sweating. So sweat away. Words that you never thought I'd say in a presentation. Um, yeah. And so how many hours behind are you? Um, well, I guess it depends where you are exactly. We're, uh, we're at UTC minus 10 here if you're a fan of, you know, time zones. So, uh, which would be make us three hours behind the West Coast in the summer, uh, six hours behind Eastern time. Uh, although uh, Hawaii here does not uh, mar use daylight savings time. And so in the winter time, we're only two hours behind the West Coast and five hours behind Eastern time. Uh, but right now in the summertime here, we're six hours behind the East, three hours behind the Pacific. Gotcha. Thank so you. it's, I guess, one o'clock in the afternoon right now, which is heat of the day. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. Okay. And we're, looks like we're getting some people in the room here telling us where they're from. Um, All right. Cool. Cochrane, you have us. Yeah. Cochrane is 24 degrees with clear skies. Um, Mississauga and Montreal, 22 degrees and partly cloudy. Thanks, Kareem. <laughs> All right. Hey, Kareem. Sounds like a nice day coast to coast almost. Huh? That's not bad at all. End it's of August little, is always a good time. A little cloudy in Barrie, Ontario, um, but that's okay. I'm, I'm cool with that. <laughs> <laughs> Brighton, Ontario, 21 degrees and cloudy. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're looking at 7.03. Um, people are slowly coming into the room, but I think um, if it's all right, I'll just get started. Um, and so good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Speaker Series, talks hosted by the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and Sky News. And co-hosting with me tonight is Eric Wickham, RASC's Communications Coordinator. Um, welcome, Eric. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for having me. I hope I don't ruin anything by being here. <laughs> um, I've done okay so far, but I mean, give it time. Um, <laughs> you're doing great. You're doing great. We don't have to Thank set the bar too low. Um, <laughs> um, and so, um, the man that we all came here to see, Cam Whipper, has been a telescope operator and scientific observer at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope since 2015. Uh, growing up in Nanaimo, British Columbia, uh, he never imagined he would spend nearly a decade and counting living, living in Hawaii and working on Mauna Kea, the best place on earth for astronomical observations. Uh, tonight, Cam will tell the story of how he found himself on Mauna Kea. Uh, Mauna Kea. Mo Mo Mauna, I wrote it out, I'm sorry guys. Uh, no, yeah. From his days as a student at Vancouver Island anniversary or University uh, to his first night up on the summit nearly 14,000 feet above sea level. He's also giving us a brief history of astronomy in Hawaii and an exploration of how modern astronomical observ or how a modern astronomical observatory conducts scientific observations and please welcome Cam. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you so much, Landria, for that introduction. That's exactly what we'll be doing here uh, tonight, or today, or this afternoon, or wherever you are um, picking this up from. So uh, first thing we'll do here, get uh, screen sharing going here. Before we get in, I'm just going to make one note that if you would like to speak to the chat, um, just make sure that you've clicked on all panelists and attendees um, so that everybody who's actually here can see what you're commenting. Um, and if you have any questions, um, at the very bottom, you'll see Q&A. Just click there and you can enter your questions. And then at the um, kind of throughout or at the end, we'll be asking Cam questions that are that are in that Q&A. Um, Again, take it away. All right. So I guess first, let's make sure everything looks good there. You got the presentation there up full screen. Looks good on you guys' end. Looks good for me. All right. Excellent. So uh, yeah, thank you again, everyone, uh, Alindria and Eric, for that. Uh, and Jenna, of course, who's not here, but she's also worked hard to get this together. I'm sure some of you are RASC members who are familiar with Jenna. Thank you her as well for getting this going. It's my pleasure to uh, be here talking to you all. So warm welcome to the RSC members and others who perhaps are not our members of the RASC. I'm glad you could uh, join us here uh, today for this presentation. Uh, as mentioned, the talk is titled uh, Hawaiian Nights. This is, this is a personal journey from uh, Vancouver Island to Mauna Kea. And uh, this will be a kind of a three-part presentation. The first part, I'll talk a little about uh, how I got here, you know, my personal story. You know, my journey from Vancouver Island to Mauna Kea. We'll then go over uh, why does here even uh, exist? How, how can I be here at all? Uh, and what do we actually do here? These are the three questions. This is the three parts of this presentation. And uh, we'll go through each one by one and we'll have an opportunity to ask a couple questions in between each segment. And then of course, we'll have a, a nice Q&A at the end of the presentation as well. So question one, question two, question three, uh, there is of course a question zero in this. And that is uh, of course, where is here? Now we kind of uh, gave, gave away the game a little bit within the introductions here talking about temperatures and whatnot of where, where I am here. But uh, the answer to this, this question, where, uh, where is here uh, is of course uh, here in in Hawaii. So I am coming to you uh, from Hawaii. Now, some of you are likely very familiar with Hawaii, but for those of you who are not familiar with Hawaii, it is an archipelago of islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, down in the tropics, of course, just uh, a little north of the uh, equator. There's uh, eight islands total uh, in Hawaii, and the four main islands are the ones you've likely heard of here. Up there uh, in the north, you have uh, Hawaii, and then you have o Oahu, this is where places like Honolulu and Waikiki are uh, located over on the island of Oahu. Maui, which is, uh, you know, most, it seems like this is the Canadian's favorite island over on Maui there. And then, of course, we have uh, the big island of, of Hawaii. So these are our four main islands. You may have been to some of these, all of these, or perhaps none of these at all. But this gives you a little bit of sense of the state itself and uh, kind of our location here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The closest point to North America is San Francisco, which is around 2,300 miles or so to the uh, northeast. So we're really, uh, really isolated here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We'll zoom a little bit here on the big island, the island of Hawaii. And this island, if you have the landmarks here, if you've been to the big island, you'll also be familiar with some of these places here. There's the city of Hilo there on the east coast, Hilo Bay. Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. This is where the volcanoes are, where the uh, Kilauea eruption was a couple of years ago. And we'll talk briefly about that a little bit later in the presentation. There's over on the west side, of course, is uh, kind of the more touristy part of the island. It's the drier side, the sunnier side, the towns of Kailua Kona, and then the resort areas of South Kohala and Waikoloa. This gives you a little bit of some geography here just to place where we're at. I am on the big island. I'm right here, a little, uh, little town called Pepekeo, just north of Hilo on the east coast. As we mentioned, uh, it's about 1 p.m. here in, in Hawaii. Pepekeo is actually an old sugar plantation village. The entire eastern part of the Big Island and many parts across Hawaii were historically used for sugar plantations. It was Hawaii's main industry for uh, decades, uh, sugar plantation. And so many little towns exist throughout the islands that are old sugar plantation towns. 
that industry has since uh, effectively totally, uh, totally died. Uh, it simply couldn't compete with lower, uh, lower wage areas in other parts of the world. But little villages and towns still exist, and I live in one here, uh, Pepekeo, just north of Hilo on the east coast of the island. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea is right here. It's this part. It's this feature there on the northern part of the island. It's, uh, as we'll get into a little bit later when we talk about some of the geology of the island, it is one of the volcanoes uh, on the island, and it's one of the tallest mountains uh, in existence. And we'll get to that all a little bit later in the presentation. All right, so now we've answered question zero here. We'll move on to our first question, question one, which is, how did I get here? Here, of course, being uh, the big island of Hawaii and uh, on Mauna Kea. So to quote Will Smith there, this means that we need to do a little bit of rewinding here, going back to the beginning. Uh, and so we'll start back on Vancouver Island. This is a picture of me. I tried to find uh, the most, Van, you know, quote unquote, Vancouver Island picture I could find and I figured me with a salmon, it's hard to get more West Coast, more Vancouver Island than that. And so there's a picture there. And of course the upper right hand corner there is a shot of the waterfront of Nanaimo where I grew up. So I was actually born in Calgary, but both my parents were from uh, the city of Nanaimo. They both grew up in Nanaimo. And uh, when I was only a few months old, we moved back to Vancouver Island. Uh, I can only imagine the stress it was trying to move from Alberta back to BC with a young child only a few months old. I think my parents were probably, uh, you know, glad when we got back to the island and that, that move was over. I grew up in Nanaimo in a house that belonged to my mother's grandparents. You know, we, they built that house back in the 1950s, and that was the house that we grew up in. They, my mother and my siblings still live uh, in that house uh, to this day. And uh, my father was a fishing guide, a civil servant. My mother was a school teacher. Um, I realized as I look at this that I've used the term was. It makes it sound like they maybe have passed their mouth. They're very, very healthy, very much alive at this point. They're still a civil servant. My mother's still a school teacher. And I imagine they're probably uh, tuning in right now and perhaps talking to themselves uh, right with that. So that's a little bit about my history where I grew up here on the island. Uh, moving on to a little bit as I grew up in Nanaimo, I uh, attended a Woodland Secondary School. Those of you who are maybe from Nanaimo are very familiar with that. It's a public high school. You know, I played basketball. You can see a picture of me uh, in my basketball warm up there on the right hand side. Did that from grade eight to grade 11. Um, I didn't play in grade 12 because I got a, a part-time job in a grocery store and I decided I wanted to focus more on working in the grocery store. And, uh, you know, that was kind of my high school. That's my childhood. I was, and crucially, you know, I didn't really have any big astronomy dreams right now at this point in time. It was a, something I was interested in, but I didn't really think much of it as on a career-wise. And you know, some of you may be wondering why I'm going through this. And the reason I like to mention this when I talk to folks is, this is particularly for any younger people that may be watching in that many times when people give presentations, I've seen presentations like this that people give, there's often uh, people say things like, oh, I knew I wanted to do this since I was young. You know, I was a kid and I wanted to be an astronomer. I, you know, I wanted to be a doctor. Or I wanted to be a fireman since I was a child. And, and I think sometimes the message gets sent that, you know, you have to have this dream since childhood if you're gonna do a, something unusual or, you know, impressive in some way. And, that's simply not, not the case. You, you don't have to go through childhood or high school having any sort of grand plan. You know, you don't, you, it's okay to not know what you want to do. And I just want to emphasize that, that my growing, my growing up was astronomy was something I enjoyed. I thought it was a hobby, but it was nothing that I thought I could do a career in. And so just because you don't have a plan, you don't have a, you know, a, a grand idea of what you're going to do as you grow up, that's totally okay. You don't have to have that. That can come later on. So I'd like to mention that, and this is why I wanted to start off with this story, um, just emphasize that point. So uh, moving on uh, to Vancouver Island University. So if you are in Nanaimo or Vancouver Island, you may be familiar with this campus. Perhaps you played on a sports team that played here as well. Uh, this is the hometown school in Nanaimo. This is our local university. And uh, when I finished high school, I uh, you know was basically told to go to university or start paying rent. You know, that was the, and my, my mother may have a slightly different version of that story, but you know, I'm the one giving this talk right now. So that's my story, I'm sticking to it. Um, and so this was, you know, it kind of presented as a choice, but you know, to be honest, it was a pretty much expected that I attend school. And so, because I didn't really have a grand plan, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. I figure, you know, play kind of go the easy route and uh, attend school 
in, um, in, in Nanaimo, where I was already living. So in the fall of 2008, I started classes at uh, Vancouver Island University. And I, didn't, I wasn't part of any declared major. I wasn't part of any large program. You know, I didn't, again, I still didn't have an idea of what I wanted to do. Um, I was just taking general studies, general classes, and, you know, I was kind of exploring my options. I think I took classes at just about every science you can imagine. I took classes in chemistry and geography and geology, math, physics, uh, along with things like film studies and digital media uh, and physical education. And I was really just kind of grasping at things, trying to figure out what I wanted to do uh, later on in life. Of course, one of the other classes I took at VIU was uh, a class in astronomy. And this was in a, a class by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Greg Arcos. He's a professor, astronomy professor at VIU. And uh, he's, as we'll get to a little bit later on, he's still someone that I uh, count as a friend. And I uh, really credit him with kind of sparking my interest in astronomy that really happened that first semester at, at Vancouver Island University. So moving on a little bit later, this is when the story gets uh, a little bit surprising and unusual. Um, by 2010, I kind of knew I loved astronomy. You know, I, I figured I, maybe this is after a couple of years of studying it at school, I figured maybe this is something I can actually do in school. I can study astronomy and you know, maybe get a degree or something in astronomy. But VIU didn't have an astronomy degree. You know, they offered some intro classes. Uh, but they didn't have uh, a full degree. And so I wanted to do a degree in astronomy. I needed to transfer to a different school. Uh, now, meanwhile, while this was all happening in 2010, um, I, like I mentioned, my mother's a school teacher. And so a, and every year they get a crop of student teachers to come through to do their practicum to you know, finish off their teaching degree at the different schools across the town. And this year, they got a new crop of uh, students. And uh, one two student in particular who was finishing his degree uh, was assigned to my mother's school. Uh, and simply one morning, he wore a shirt that said University of Hawaii at Hilo, Physics and Astronomy. Now, why he chose to wear that shirt that day, or you know what other options he had, I, I you know, I, I'll never know. Um, but I, I, the surprising thing about this is that I don't think that I would be where I am today if he hadn't worn that shirt. And it's, it's these small things, you know, where things like the saying of, you know, a, a drop in the ocean can raise the sea, uh, something small can change everything. And this is one of those kind of this inflection point in my life where if something happened very differently, I'm not sure what would have happened, you know, but this gentleman wore uh, this shirt to work that day. My mother asked him about it and then came home that day and said, Cam, we should talk to this guy. He went to school in Hawaii to study astronomy. And, you know, I went and chatted with him and then, you know, one thing led to another. Eight months later, I was on a plane to Hawaii, having never even been to Hawaii, uh, with a letter with a sentence to the physics and astronomy program. And, you know, and this is something else I'd like to emphasize to any younger people watching is that opportunities may present themselves and they may not seem like a huge opportunity or a particularly important opportunity or something just happens that you don't know where to lead. Um, but often, the best thing to do is try to take these opportunities as they come to you, you know, and because you, ne you never know where, where, you'll, where you'll end up, where you'll go. And I think that's kind of one of the best things I can tell to young folks is that never rule anything out, you know, never, you know, poo-poo anything or never put any ideas down. Go for it if you can, and it may lead to somewhere you never expect. And that was certainly my case here. So after that, um, once I got to Hawaii, this is my university here in Hawaii. This is the campus of the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Uh, if you're familiar with the University of Hawaii at all, um, it's quite a large system of schools. Um, it's no, not a single institution. The main school is over on the island of Oahu in, the, in Honolulu. That's the main campus. The Hilo campus is a smaller campus. Um, for those in, in uh, BC watching this, it's analogous to how uh, UBC Okanagan is to UBC in Vancouver. I'm sure if you're elsewhere in the country, there's other uh, schools that have a main campus somewhere and a smaller campus somewhere else. That's the situation here. So UH Hilo was a smaller campus of the main in the main system, um, but they were on the Big Island, which was where Mauna Kea was. It was where this gentleman I talked to had gone to school. And so I uh, decided to apply here. And after about two years at this school, I, I transferred down. Luckily, many of my uh, credits from VIU and Nanaimo had transferred down. So I only had about two and a half years left to do to finish my degree. 
Uh, and I graduated in 2013 with this uh, degree in astronomy from uh, UH Hilo. Now, one of the great things about um, being here is that I was able to also work part-time. Um, now, for, in the US, foreign students can work part-time jobs, on, quote unquote, on campus in positions related to their field of study. Now, there's a, a planetarium on the campus of the university. And so I was able to work there uh, during school and kind of get an idea of what it's like to actually have a career in astronomy as well. Uh, in addition to that, I was able to spend my first nights up on Mauna Kea during school and I start to learn about how observatories actually work and the careers that are uh, that come with those. Because before I came down, I had no idea about telescopes, how they worked, observatories, you know, how they operated, and even the kind of jobs that existed in observatories. You know, you kind of have that vision where everyone's an astronomer, uh, which I know now could not be further from the truth. Something like maybe 10 to 15 percent of jobs in observatories are astronomers. You know, 85% of jobs are not astron uh, astronomer jobs. So, you know, once I uh, was at school, I was able to use Mount Kea. There's a shot of me on that night there with the mountain in the background from the uh, from the access road. Um, this is one of the great advantages I had while attending the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Um, I was able to spend time on Mount Kea at observatories while I'm still in school. You know, I could you know go to class. And then I go up at work and come to class and do that again. And there's a couple of times where I'd spend all night on the summit, come down, go to school, and then head back up, head up again uh, to work at night. And it's for probably couldn't do that anymore. But back when I was, you know, 20, 21, 22, that was doable. So my first positions up on Mount Kea was as a volunteer warm body and uh, as a part-time uh, work as an intern and as what's known as a laser spotter. So those are two words which you may have got your attention, a warm body or a laser spotter, which are rather unusual positions to have as a student worker. So I just want to look at those real quick because I give you a first introduction to how positions on Mauna Kea work. So a warm body, I looked up on it on Urban Dictionary there and you can see the definition is a uneducated, untrained, poorly or poorly trained individual place in a workspace where you're neither technically capable of performing the required task or nor performing any useful activity. And that pretty much sums up what it's like to be a warm body on Mount Kea. You're, there's a, what's known as a two person safety rule where no one can be alone on Mount Kea. And that's because of the altitude. The mountain is uh, so high, nearly 14,000 feet that um, altitude sickness is a possibility. People can get sick from being up there at altitude. And so, people cannot be alone. And so you, can, uh, you have to be two people at least at all times together. Um, the difficult part is that many uh, telescopes in modern times can be operated by one person. Everything can be done by one person. You don't need two people or more to operate the facility, um, but that person cannot be alone. And so the some observatories would ask for visiting astronomers who perhaps their data is being observed to come up and join the op telescope operator at the summit. Or, and like in my case, they would look at uh, the university and ask if there's any students in the astronomy program who are available to uh, go to the summit and simply sit with the operator uh, at night. And you can imagine this is was a uh, considered a I thought it was a huge opportunity because I got to spend entire nights at the summit with a telescope operator, learning about what they did, seeing how it worked, and simply being up there on the summit. Uh, and experiencing kind of the life of a telescope operator, the life of an observatory worker. And so despite this was volunteer work, unpaid, it was huge in my understanding to understand what observatories actually did. And if I'd gone to a school somewhere else that wasn't Hilo, I would never have had this opportunity. Uh, so there's my, a picture of me on one of my first nights from back in 2011, one of my first nights uh, up on uh, the mountain. It's in the control room of the uh, Caltech Millimeter Observatory. The other position I had as a student was a laser spotter, which is uh, undoubtedly the very coldest job that exists in all of Hawaii. Uh, the large observatories, like the Gemini Observatory right there you see on the right-hand side, uh, you can see the big laser shooting up the top. That's what's known as a laser guide star. Uh, it's a very powerful laser that uh, shoots many kilometers into the atmosphere all the way to the upper sodium layer in the atmosphere. These lasers are used as part of the uh, adaptive optic systems of large observatories. 
Um, the way this works is a laser shoots into the sky and it excites sodium atoms in the upper atmosphere. You notice that laser there on the right hand side is kind of a yellowy orange color. That's a very precise color. It's 589 nanometers, which is the frequency of that it, the sodium atoms are excited at. And it's also the same color as uh, a sodium vapor lamp. So if you live in a community with sodium streetlights, you'll recognize that color. It's the same color, the sodium uh, vapor color. That laser shoots up, it excites the atoms in the upper atmosphere and creates a false star, a laser guide star in the sky. Now, because it's a laser beam, they know that that laser should be perfectly collimated, that should be undistorted, it should be effectively a perfect point of light in the sky. However, due to distortions in the atmosphere, that is, you know, due to the movement of the air, that laser point moves. And so powerful computers can then see that laser move, and in real time, they can adjust the, uh, adjust the light path the, of the light coming to the telescope and remove those distortions from the images. And so uh, in that way, you, you can effectively remove the effect of the atmosphere from your images you take with your observatory. And so it's an extremely powerful tool to uh, get near space-based uh, quality images from a ground-based facility. So the rub though is that the FAA, the US Federal Aviation Administration mandated that personnel must monitor the laser at all times to ensure that no aircraft fly in to the beam. And so they would hire people, in my case, student workers, to stand outside of the observatory at night on the summit of Mauna Kea and watch for planes that might be flying near the laser. Now, as I mentioned, the coldest job in Hawaii because it can often in the winter time it can be you know you could be down sub zero temperatures uh, with wind chill you could be down at you know uh, perhaps minus ten or minus twenty Celsius um, and you're just standing up there watching for planes. Now you have this giant red button you know a classic big red button and you can push that button if the plane comes close to the laser. Otherwise you just are watching for planes and recording any planes that fly over. Now, Hawaii is very isolated, as we talked about, and so very few planes fly over. There's our local kind of inter-island flights, but those basically stop uh, around 10 o'clock at night. Other than that, the only flights that ever fly near the islands are the flights that go from on the west coast of North America, you know, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Vancouver, to places like Australia, New Zealand, or uh, you know, Fiji, the South Pacific Islands. And that's it. And so you might get two or three planes a night flying over Mauna Kea, but you need to be out there for pretty much the entire night watching for them. So a good job for us. If that sounds like student work to you, you're, you're darn right. That's definitely a student job. Uh, and the, I guess the difference with this job is that it's now been assumed by a robot. And so the, they finally came out with a robot that can do this. The FAA signed off on it. And so a robot can now do this position. The robot simply listens uh, to a transponder the aircraft put out. If it detects a transponder, it triangulates the position of that transponder, or, you know, basically from kind of where it's coming from, and then it will shut the laser off if it thinks that the plane's getting too close to the laser beam. So, you know, they talk about in the future, perhaps jobs will be people's job replaced by robot. Well, you know, in my case, I've already been replaced by robot once, so I hope that doesn't happen again uh, in the future. So these jobs are not, no longer exist, but they were instrumental to kind of my introduction to observatories and uh, how they work, how they operate, the kind of jobs that exist there. And, and to be honest, it really made me want to work at observatory more than anything. So flash forward now, I graduated in 2013. Uh, and now you're here in 2015. And this is really the year that uh, everything uh, changed for me. Uh, by 2015, um, I was still working as a laser spotter uh, for the Gemini Observatory, the, the previous observatory there. Um, I was also working as a laser operator at that same observatory. So some nights I would operate that laser, other nights I would do the laser spotting. And I was at the planetarium at Emiloa still. And I was also now a part-time operator for te another telescope, the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, which is a sub-millimeter facility, which is high frequency radio waves, um, kind of between the infrared and uh, you know, radio spectrum, kind of high frequency, which is sub-millimeter wavelengths. So I had these part-time positions um, but I was still working on my, stu my U.S. student visa. Uh, there was a special uh, U.S. visa status you could get called optional practical training. 
and it, that basically would allow uh, foreign students to work in the US after they've graduated within their field of study. And so because I graduated in astronomy, I could work in the US in astronomy jobs. Um, but this was not a, a long term thing. It was initially for one year. And then at my time, you could get another, I think it was another it might have been 11 months, something like that, another year extension. So you kind of get two, two years, I think, on this permit. Otherwise, then you would have to leave the US. You couldn't extend it any further. But in 2015, um, I was hired by the Canada France Hawaii Telescope as a full time telescope operator. And cr crucially for me, they're willing to uh, transition me from my student visa permit to a standard US work, uh, work permit so that I could remain in the United States to continue to work on, on Mauna Kea. And so, you know, when I say everything changed for me, it was because that was the end of my student work permit, beginning of my standard US work permit. And it's what allowed me to uh, remain in the US to this day. So uh, as I mentioned at the top, uh, I do work at the CFHT. Um, so, you know, I often describe my position as a telescope operator or scientific observer. And it's just how um, Alendria introduced me at the top of this talk. My job title is actually remote observer, but that's the most vague job title ever. It tells you nothing about what I actually do. And so I generally don't say that title until I give some backstory to what I actually do. Um, so as I mentioned, since 2015, I've been at CFHT. Um, and so my base job at CFHT as a remote observer, telescope operator, is to spend roughly 90 nights per year uh, conducting the scientific operations of the observatory. And so what that means is that I will be given a, a plan of what to operate for the night for an astronomer, and then I'll execute that plan. Uh, later on in the talk here, we'll talk about that process and how astronomer gets data from observatory. Um, but for now, I just wanna say that this is, my role is that I take the data. You can imagine astronomer is someone who um, comes up with what they want to do and then the observer is this person that actually executes that task. You know, an analogy would be someone, say, a, a chemistry lab technician. The chemist might come up with the experiment in the lab, but the lab tech may actually perform that experiment. That's, you know, in astronomy, I'm kind of analogous to the lab tech in a chem lab, in that I take the data for the astronomers where someone else decides what they want to have done. And as you may get from the remote part of that title, this is done remotely. Uh, and so this picture here on the right-hand side is actually from uh, the summit control room, but I very rarely operate from the summit control room. Most of it is done remotely. Um, and that's simply due to advances in uh, technology and in computing since the observatory was built. It's now possible to fully remote control an observatory from uh, basically anywhere. And so our headquarters are in, are in Waimea on the Big Island, which is a town that's down at around 2300 feet elevation far below the summit elevation and it allowed, means there's no issues altitude sickness there's no two-person rule you can do it by yourself and so it's much easier on the people much easier on personnel and uh, it's simply a better way to operate it also means that you can do it by yourself uh, and so this just job is done totally alone and so i'll spend um, between 12 and 15 hours depending on the time of year uh, operating telescope throughout the night and as I mentioned, 90 nights per year, that's split into five or six night runs. Uh, so we'll do five or six nights in a row, and then it'll be the turn of another observer to operate. And after each of them do their shift, then I'll come back for my next five nights. Uh, at CFHT, there are four observers. And so you know, uh, roughly 25% of the year or 90 nights of the year are uh, my nights. And so I, I'll do, uh, and that's 365 nights a year. We operate uh, throughout all holidays, weekends, whatever, every single night of the year, uh, we'll operate and uh, take data. Um, so with that, uh, we come to our first uh, little break. So we've answered the question now, uh, why do, uh, you know, why am I here? Um, so this is the point now where if you have a couple of questions here, I'm sure I uh, can throw them up and I'm happy to answer them. And then we'll move on to our question two here. All right. So Alindra, do you want to go first? Or do you want me to read the questions from the audience first? Um, I, I go, please, the questions from the audience would be great. Okay, perfect. Um, so I got one question from Dennis. Um, just, you know, is it that bad to, to breathe there at, at 4,000 meters above sea level? Uh, do you have a special procedure to be ready slash not faint? 
Um, certainly, yeah. Uh, so there's definitely challenges with that. And uh, we would often go up at least the day before. There's a mid-level facility at about 10,000 feet elevation. And so we would try to spend uh, about at least 12 to 24 hours at that mid-level facility acclimating to the altitude. And so that would allow us to, once it went to the summit itself, we'd already have spent some time at a higher elevation and hopefully our bodies are prepared. We've, got, we've gotten more used to um, the altitude and then we'd be a little better off. There is also, of course, supplemental oxygen up at the summit. And so all observatories have you know, oxygen tanks you can use. And so if you start to feel lightheaded and dizzy and whatnot, the initial symptoms of altitude sickness, you can um, you know, put yourself on oxygen and that'll eventually cure your symptoms immediately. Um, if things start to get worse, though, um, some of the worst symptoms of altitude sickness include um, bad nausea, even throwing up, um, fainting. And with those, if that starts to occur, the only uh, uh, solution is to descend to a higher elevation. And so there's a reason for the two-person rule is that if someone begins to experience that, the other person can drive them off the mountain and, or get them the medical help that they need. Um, because, you know, you know, it's also... You, you also, because of your lack of oxygen, you don't think clearly, it's hypoxia. And so um, it's often described as maybe have a feeling you get after two or three glasses of wine, for example, you kind of have to feel a bit dizzy, we call it your know, summit brain. And uh, that means that it can be difficult to make clear rational decisions, which is why you're never alone. Awesome. Um, so there's, there's a few more questions. Um, Alendra, do you want to take these over? Or do you want me to continue? Uh, no, you can certainly go ahead. I guess um, I was going to ask uh, just to kind of follow up on that because yeah, like 10,000 feet is like in aviation, you're not actually allowed to fly. I think it's 30 minutes, um, more than 30 minutes above 10,000 feet. Like there are rules like that. And so if you're spending that much time up there um, and you're, you're also going back down and so you're not staying up there. And so you don't kind of adjust if you adjust your back down at, um, you know, at a lower level a little later on. So for yourself, like how, how did you find it? Like, did you have to, like, how did you adjust and did you, how did it affect you? Um, for me personally, I've, I've not had any really bad experiences. Um, generally, it seems to be, there seems to be a, uh, an almost innate response. Some people simply can handle it better. Um, and from what I, you know, I'm not a medical expert in this part at all, but what I understand it has comes down to um, your, your natural red blood cell count within your bloodstream. Uh, red blood cells are what transport oxygen. And so if you kind of naturally have more red blood cells, you'll have a higher carrying capacity for oxygen. And so if you have an even lower count, you have a lower carrying capacity and so you'll be more affected by altitude. So some of it is um, kind of this innate ability to handle the oxygen. Um, and, other, and, and for me also it's experience. And so I'll go up there and I'll still, sometimes I'll feel those effects. Um, but I, for, at this point, I know what to expect. The other issue is people begin to feel bad and then they get anxious and they get nervous and they start to kind of get this panicky response and things, it's kind of a positive feedback loop. The worse you feel, the more panicked you get and things spiral on you. And so I, the other flip side is that now I know how I'm gonna feel. And so I don't have any of that response. I, I, it's expe I expect to feel some way and so you kind of just continue on with your day. Um, so it's partly innate, partly experience, uh, and partly just being very careful and monitoring how you're gonna feel. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Eric, maybe just one more question and then we'll let it carry on because we're coming up on 7.40, so. All right, okay, so I'll do the, the one right at the top. It's from Nicholas. Uh, does the laser beam producing the artificial star not interfere with the telescope's view of its target? Uh, yeah, that's that's actually that's a great question. Um, that's uh, I'm glad someone picked up on that. Uh, the laser, as you said, you can see the laser. It's in an optical frequency. The laser guide star is only used on with infrared observations, and so you're looking at a totally different band than your laser beam. And so you know you're looking at an optical laser, um, but you're, in, you're you're looking at it in, in the near infrared. And so the laser is totally invisible at, at those wavelengths because at a very particular band, 589 nanometers, you can look at the infrared, which is in a very different wavelength than uh, what your laser is. And so it's totally invisible to, to the observed instruments at those wavelengths. Okay, great to know. Like that's, um, and it, it makes sense when you explain it. So thanks. Um, yeah. And yeah, I would suggest that we kind of 
uh, continue on and then we can ask the rest of the questions kind of as the presentation continues. Sounds good. All right. So the next question we have here is, uh, why does here even exist? Here, of course, being uh, Hawaii. So we'll go back to our map here of, of Hawaii. So we have all of our islands here. And now all of these islands, the first thing we want to point out is all these islands are the tips of volcanoes. If you've been to Hawaii, you've been in a volcano. Every island is the very top of a volcano. There's nowhere in Hawaii that's not a volcano. All right, and that includes up, you know, uh, to the northwest. There's smaller islands up there, you know, place, including places like the French Frigate Shoals and Midway, which uh, were made famous from certain battles up down back in World War II. These are all part of the same chain of islands. They're all the tips of huge volcanoes. So this chain actually extends all the way to the Aleutian Islands. If you look there on the right-hand side there, you can see this chain. The uh, little arrow there follows that chain all the way up. And this tip, it, the islands past, past midway go underwater. They've been eroded, so they're no longer above sea level. But under, under sea, these little seamounts, as they're known, exist all the way to the Aleutians. And this is a product of uh, plate tectonics and a large hotspot that exists uh, in the Earth's crust. So as I mentioned, they're all massive volcanoes rising from the ocean floor. They're all formed from the same hotspot. The plates continually move in the same direction. And as the islands move off the hotspot, those volcanoes die and new, uh, new volcanoes form above the hotspot. The big island is the newest island. It's one of the active volcanoes. It's the one that's over the hotspot right now. The big island is formed of five volcanoes. These are the five volcanoes here. Uh, Kohala, Mauna Kea, Hualalai, Mauna Loa, and Kilauea. And the five, there's also a sixth volcano that is uh, forming this off the south coast. That's called Loihi, and it's uh, still submerged. It will likely emerge above the ocean in the next 100,000 years. It's still about a kilometer below sea level, but it is nearly 10,000 feet tall, so it's not a small mountain in any, in any series. Uh, the tallest of these volcanoes uh, is Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea, though, is not active. The three active volcanoes are uh, Hualalai, which erupted last in uh, 1801, so about 200 years ago. Mauna Loa, which erupted in 1984. Uh, Kilauea, as you know, erupted spectacularly a couple years ago, uh, the biggest eruption in something like 400 years for Kilauea. Uh, and then Loihi, last erupted in 1996. So all these volcanoes there are uh, mostly active, with Mauna Kea considered dormant. So Mauna Kea is the tallest mountain on Earth, and I'll explain that in a little bit moment. And so tall that, yes, it does snow on Mauna Kea. It does snow in Hawaii. So uh, looking at Mauna Kea a little bit closer here, from sea level, it rises uh, over four kilometers into the air, uh, almost 14,000 feet, as was established earlier. Uh, from the ocean floor, though, it rises over more than 10 kilometers, or 33,000 feet, making it far and away the tallest mountain on Earth. It's, near, near, it's more than a kilometer taller than Mount Everest if you measure from the base of the mountain to its peak, not simply from sea level uh, to its peak. As I mentioned, it's considered dormant. It's not erupted in around 4,600 years, um, but it is expected to erupt again in the future. It's not, not considered done by any means, but it's been quite a while since it last erupted. It's also rather interestingly, the fifth tallest volcano in the solar system. The only four taller volcanoes on any planet are four volcanoes on Mars. Uh, you have four volcanoes, Olympus Mons being the tallest, there's three others, and then Mauna Kea is the fifth tallest in the solar system. So Mount Mauna Kea is not big on an Earth scale, but it's big on, on the scale of the entire solar system. Now the picture on the left-hand side there is taken from Mauna Loa, the other volcano, which is active. Uh, Mauna Loa uh, is only around 120 feet lower than Mauna Kea. So it's interesting in that you have two volcanoes that are almost exactly the same height, with Mauna Kea just being uh, you know, about 120 feet higher. So uh, now this is a really important slide because we're trying to talk about Mauna Kea, so it's really important to acknowledge this. Um, Mauna Kea is extremely important uh, in the Native Hawaiian culture. Now, some of you may have heard about this recently. There's been some protests regarding the development of a new facility on Mauna Kea. The, this talk is not uh, gonna, we're not gonna talk about a lot about the cultural aspects or the, the uh, controversy here, but it's really important that we acknowledge this. Um, it is, you know, has a name, longer name of Mauna Awakea, named for the Sky Father, and it's considered the home of Puli'ahu, the goddess of snow in Hawaiian culture. 
Uh, in particular, the summit region is considered sacred uh, in Native Hawaiian culture. Um, now, in addition to these cultural uh, side of things, also a political side of things, Mauna Kea is part of what's known as the ceded lands, lands that were property of the Hawaiian kingdom and the crown of Hawaii prior to the illegal overthrow of the monarchy in 1893. These lands were then transferred to the control of the uh, Republic of Hawaii, which is the uh, successor government after the overthrow. And then they were then transferred to the uh, territory of Hawaii. Uh, and then they became part of the state of Hawaii when it was admitted to the union as the 50th state in 1959. Uh, and so all of these mean that there are cultural considerations, there's political considerations, and these all make the development on Mauna Kea highly controversial. Um, and to this day, there's you know, the political side of things, there's the cultural side of things, and it's quite a, it's definitely a large issue here in Hawaii. And I'm sure many of you are aware of that happening, uh, you know, as, it's, as it draws parallels to things that are happening regarding uh, pipelines and whatnot being built on, on, over on in North America. So like I said, we're not gonna focus in on that talk, but I wanna acknowledge that, sit here to acknowledge that, that this is the reality of the situation on Mauna Kea. And to keep this in mind as we, as we talk a little bit more about astronomy on Mauna Kea and uh, telescopes and how they operate. It's all happening uh, you know, with also this happening in parallel. So we're gonna begin our story uh, regarding the astronomy on Mauna Kea with the 1960 tsunami. This devastated uh, Hilo in 1960 and uh, was really the genesis of how astronomy began. So this was, uh, caused by the most powerful earthquake in recorded history, which many of you know struck Chile in May 1960, 9.5 on the Richter scale, uh, the biggest earthquake ever recorded. It devastated Hilo uh, and destroyed much of the city. You can see on the left-hand side here a picture of the city after the tsunami. Uh, this huge tsunami, uh, as I mentioned, it also killed 61 people. And it was the second tsunami in about 14 years. In 1946, the, an 8.6 earthquake in Alaska did the exact same thing to Hilo. So, you know, this was the second time this had happened uh, and people had just rebuilt the city and then it was destroyed again. And so it was a really uh, huge deal for Hilo to have to have to go through this again after it had just happened this a decade and a half earlier. Uh, and so, as, you know, it just devastated the economy of the island. And so the Chamber of Commerce began to explore Mauna Kea uh, and you know, new business drivers, new options. Uh, yes, they'd heard from people who worked at the weather station on Mauna Loa that Mauna Kea would look clear at night, even when it was cloudy and raining in Hilo. So this was all in the name of trying to rebuild the economy after the tsunami. So this brings us to our familiar face to some of you who may recognize this name, uh, Gerard Kuiper. So in 1963, the cha local chamber of commerce here uh, in Hilo sent a letter to uh, the US and observatories, or sorry, universities in US and Japan, uh, inquiring about interest in observatory in Mauna Kea. There'd been an initially over on Maui, a solar observatory had been built on Haleakala. And so uh, they were now kind of getting to this, the idea of an observatory had kind of entered the cultural conscience, the conscience of the, the people who lived here. And the only response was from uh, this gentleman, Jared Kuiper, who is from, uh, of course, the Kuiper Belt is named after him. Yeah. And so in 1964, a small observatory was built uh, on Mauna Kea. This was done um, with assistance of the state of Hawaii, who had just come into existence. In 19, as I mentioned, 1959, Hawaii entered the Union as the 50th state of the United States. This is only a few years after statehood. And so they're looking to have this new, uh, newfound kind of building up the, uh, the, this new state that had just formed. And so the state agreed to uh, pay for a road to be uh, created to the summit of Mauna Kea. They built a small observatory with uh, a gentleman by the name of Alika Herring, uh, a native Hawaiian who was very experienced in building telescopes and connecting observations, staffed this new observatory and his measurements um, along with uh, Jared Kuiper's analysis and assistance determined that Mauna Kea had exquisite conditions, even better than what they'd measured over on Haleakala, which is uh, about, at about 10,000 feet elevation, so 4,000 feet below uh, Mauna Loa. I'm oh, sorry, uh, Mauna Kea. And this began a new era in astronomy. By 1968, uh, the first observatory had been built by the University of Hawaii. And you can see it there on a snowy summit. It's the only telescope on Mauna Kea. 
And this really began the observatories uh, being built on the summit. Nearly continuously from the mid 1970s to the mid 1990s, observatories were built, um, going from the one we have here in 1968 to the uh, dozen observatories that exist on Mount Akea today. Uh, oh, I forgot to get through this, but as you can see here, uh, the returns in the observatories established the uh, summit as the premier location for astronomy. Um, so what does make Mauna Kea so good for astronomy? For one thing, uh, it's isolated and has extremely dark skies. As you mentioned about the closest land mass is uh, California at 2,300 miles away. There's a very dark skies, hardly any light pollution. The air that comes over the island is extremely, uh, it's not, it's totally undisturbed because it's traveling over thousands of miles of uh, flat ocean. And so this air is not turbulent. It's very clear, very stable air. It's the summit has high altitude, as we mentioned regarding the altitude sickness. It also has a tropical inversion layer. And this layer in the atmosphere keeps the humidity and the wet, the tropical weather down below the summit elevation. And so this la inversion layer exists at about seven, 8,000 feet normally. And so the summit of Mauna Kea is high, far above that. And so the summit, despite being in the tropics, is extremely dry. Humidity below 10% is very common on uh, Mauna Kea. And this makes not only optical infrared observations possible, but also that some millimeter observations possible. Uh, some millimeter observations, uh, those wavelengths are absorbed by water vapor. And so if you can get above the water vapor in the atmosphere, you can detect these wavelengths. And so that makes Mauna Kea an excellent site for this science as well. It's near the equator, and that's important because it means that a vast majority of the sky is observable. You know, if you're up at the North Pole, you can only ever see half the sky because nothing ever rises or sets. If you're on the equator, you could, at some point, maybe you can see nearly all the sky. And so in, on Mauna Kea, you can get about 85% of the entire sky is visible at some point in the year. This means you can look at almost any uh, target in the sky. So its location makes it uh, very good for astronomy in that sense as well. As he mentions, very dry air and very clear skies. That inversion layer traps most of the clouds below the inversion layer, meaning that the only clouds that go over are high altitude cirrus clouds. Regular, normal, you know, our favorite puffy clouds we're so familiar with are all trapped below and do not reach the summit of the uh, mountain. And finally, all of this makes for excellent sea image quality, or it's known as seeing. This is a measurement of the atmospheric clarity uh, and it's, and it's uh, done in terms of degrees. So it's the amount of, the done, essentially it's the amount of detail you can get in your image. Uh, and so the, the still air, the clear air, the, the high altitude above a lot of the atmosphere makes the image quality, the clarity of the air very good. That laser, laser guide stars don't have a whole lot of work to do because the air is already quite still and quite stable. Um, if you're all familiar with astro astronomical seeing, um, on Mauna Kea, it's not unheard of to get uh, 0.3 or 0.4 arc seconds seeing uh, without any adaptive optics at all. Um, that's kind of, uh, that's, you know, that's a good night on Mauna Kea is 0.3 seeing. And so it gives you an idea of the clarity. If you're not familiar with seeing, that's, that's better than uh, any, anywhere you get at sea level. At sea level, you might get one or two arc seconds. So that you're looking at five or six times better or more than what you would get at sea level. Okay, so to just to drive this point home of what the summit looks like now, I have a one minute little time-lapse video to share with you all showing uh, what the summit looks like over the course of a night on Mauna Kea. So we'll come back with you in just a minute.
All right, so that hopefully gives you a little bit of an idea of what the summit environment looks like now with all the observatories that have been built up on the summit region. So this was where we're going to start for more questions, but I know we're running a little bit long. Did you want to continue to power through or should we take a little stop here for questions? Um, there's one question here, if it's okay with Eric, sure. if we kind of like ask it just because it's here. Um, it's from Alan Dyer. Um, and so it's kind of relevant to what you were just talking about. Do you find the naked eye view of the night sky and Milky Way better from the summit or from the mid-level facility? I've heard that the lack of oxygen makes the view worse from the summit. That's absolutely correct. It does. So for, you know, machines and telescopes, you know, at the summit is far better than the mid-level. But for human observers, uh, being in the mid-level about 10,000 feet is, is better. And that's simply because the lack of oxygen means that your eyes are not quite as sensitive to a uh, low light. And so your eyes cannot see uh, the faint, faint details at the summit as well as they can see at a lower level. And so you kind of want to pick, gotta pick a, a happy medium in between the altitude and also um, the, uh, the elevation you're at. And 10,000 feet seems to be for the average person at about as high as you can go without seeing any great effects um, from altitude sickness or altitude, you know, at all. And so 10,000 feet seems to be about the optimal location for, uh, in terms of clarity and also being able to see um, as much as you can. And at the summit, you know, if you're, if you're on auction, of course, that's totally out of the way, but if you're simply just outside on your own without supp supplemental oxygen, the you know, eyes are not quite as sensitive at the summit as they would be a little bit lower down. That's really, I had no idea um, that that was a factor. I mean, that's, um, uh, I've, because I have some pilot training, like that's, um, like hypoxia is something we do have to talk about. And I've never heard that it affects your eyesight as well as your, uh, um, you know, mind. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it could be the kind of thing where, it, it, you know, in, a day, in daylight, it may not make much of a difference, but when low light at night and low light situations is when you notice the effects of it. That's interesting. Thank you. And yeah, I would suggest just continuing on and we can take the rest of the questions to the end. And so if anybody right, else perfect. has any more questions, they can just put them into the Q&A as well. All right, perfect. All right, so uh, the last question we want to talk about, or I'd like to talk about is question three, what do we actually do here? Uh, you know, here being now in Hawaii and here being at the observatory itself. Now, I'll say, you know, the caveat here is every observatory works a little bit differently. They all have their own way of operating. So this will be uh, said from the perspective of the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope. Um, but these, uh, this idea of uh, what we'll talk about is fairly applicable to most observatories. They all work on this similar model, um, but this is um, based on the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope way of operating. So this is a picture of the telescope itself inside the dome. As I mentioned, uh, First light in 1979, so it was built in the 70s. It was one of the first ones built after that university telescope was built in the 1960s. Uh, it is an optical infrared optimized telescope. That's what we do. It has a 3.6 meter primary mirror, so you know just almost 12 feet there, which for the time, 1970s, was one of the largest telescopes on Earth. Today, it has uh, far been surpassed by the likes of Gemini and Keck, Subaru. Uh, but it is still does great science, um, and that is because of our suite of instruments. So despite being uh, over 40 years old, the instrumentation on CFHT uh, is all uh, cutting edge still. We have five different instruments that span uh, effectively the entire optical infrared uh, spectrum. Um, number one being uh, our optical wide field imager called Megacam. So this takes images in the wavelengths that our eyes can see, you know, our, our, the same, those same uh, types of bands. And it's wide field, it, meaning that it can a single image covers about the area of four full moons on the sky. So if you take a four full moons as a mosaic, that's the field of view of Megacam. We also have a wide field uh, infrared imager called Weircam. Has a slightly smaller field of view than Megacam, but it does effectively the same thing, simply in, in, uh, near infrared bands. Uh, we have an optical spectropolar imager, espadons. Uh, this is a, sp a spectrograph which can take the light from a star, split it up into its component parts, and you can learn about the chemical makeup of that star, how it moves, and everything from uh, the light from espadons. 
Again, there's a, an infrared version of that called Spiro. Spiro is our newest instrument. It was delivered uh, in 2017 and it's cutting edge. It's one of the only instruments of its type on Earth. And it's very much used for exoplanet uh, studies. So uh, determining uh, if the exoplanets exist around stars. It's one of its expert, ex, uh, things it's best at. And finally, we have an optical imaging Fourier transform spectrometer, which is a mouthful I know called Satel. Uh, and the best way to think of this is almost a combination of a camera and a spectrograph. You take an image and from that image, you can get a spectra, uh, spectrum from every pixel in that image. And so you can use this kind of to almost do a, uh, you can see how things are moving, how they're rotating, how they're changing. And this is often used to study uh, molecular gas clouds and whatnot and uh, star forming regions and galaxies. So, and all these instruments are from the last about 15 years or so. And so despite being old, uh, CFHD can do science with all of these instruments here. And that's what allows it to compete with the likes of the bigger telescopes like Gemini and Keck. Um, and so with this in mind, uh, modern astronomy is very different than the classical image of a lone astronomer on top of a mountain. For one, with a two-person rule, you a lone astronomer could not be on top of a mountain if they wanted to be. Um, but in CFHT's case, in the case of many observatories, astronomers don't need to come here at all. Uh, we operate in what's known as queued service observing mode. And what that means is that, like I said, astronomers don't come to the telescope uh, and they never conduct their own observations at all. They tell us what they want and then we get that data for them. They, they don't come to CFHT. Um, and some of them may have never set foot at uh, CFHC or even on the island itself, and yet they're doing science with uh, data that came from the facilities on Mount Akea. So let's say that you want to use CFHT in this new queued surface observing mode. How would you go about doing that? So the very first step is uh, being granted observing time is the call for proposals. You can see on the right hand side here is the screenshot from the CFHC website. Actually, the call for proposals is open right now. We're accepting proposals for or the 2021A semester, which begins in February. And so astronomers from our partners, uh, which you can see there, NRC, uh, Canadian astronomers, CRNS, which is uh, the French astronomers, Asia A is Taiwan, and NO, NAOC is China. Those are our partners. Uh, Canada and France have the most observing time on CFHT at about 40 two and a half percent of the telescope time. Asia A and uh, NAOC have about 15% between them. Uh, there also is data, we get proposals from the uh, University of Hawaii's astronomers as well. And so if you're an astronomer as partner, part of these uh, communities, you can apply for time. Anyone can, who's, if you're not part of these communities, you can also apply for time uh, directly to our director. It's called director's discretionary proposal time. You can ask, basically ask the executive director of our observatory to use the time. And if he grants you time, then you can use it in that way as well. So interested users, i.e. astronomers in this case, will submit their proposals. It's a detailed description of what they want to do, how they and how they want to do it, and how much time they will need to accomplish their goals. They write this up and they submit it to what's known as a time allocation committee. The proposals are evaluated by the Time Allocation Committee. Every agency, Canada, France, Asia, Taiwan, University of Hawaii, all have a Time Allocation Committee, and they'll select the best proposals, the ones that have the most scientific merit or the ones that are most feasible by the observatory. And, you know, perhaps it's not observable at our location, or perhaps a target, we, you know, we can't do it uh, with our instrumentation, so they'll be rejected. If it can be done, though, and it's observable, and it gets a high rank, it'll be granted telescope time what happens next is the astronomer will go into the CFHT database and they will fill out their observations. They'll input their programs. They'll build their program in our database saying, I wanna look at this target for this much time at this time of the day or this time of the night, or I wanna look at these entire different fields. I wanna look at this star every night for two weeks. I wanna look at all of these separate fields and this filter, whatever it is that they, that they want to do they'll input that into our database and build their program. And uh, you can see on the left-hand side here, there's things like observing blocks, observing groups, instrument configurations, fixed targets. These are all different uh, ways that their program is defined within our database. Once it's built and there's a large tutorial for astronomers on how to do this, then their program uh, can be scheduled for observing. 
So, you know, just to recap here, they've applied for time. They've been granted time by the time allocation committee. They've now built their program in our database saying, this is what I want to happen. This is how it should happen. This is how I want things executed. And then comes time to schedule their observations. This is done by our staff of astronomers. We have an entire team called the QSO team at CFHT whose job is to schedule observations. The Q coordinator is one member of this team and they will go through all of the programs that have been accepted for a particular instrument. And then they will build a plan for a night that will be executed. On the right-hand side there, this is a, a screenshot of an email, a recent email outlining the Q plan. Uh, and so there'll be Q1, you can see halfway down there, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. These are all different plans for the night. The Q coordinator said, if, if weather is good on this night, we'll do this. If the weather is not good on this night, we'll do this backup plan. If something happens and you can't do this target, you do th this target instead. And so this allows the highest priority observations to all be scheduled. And, it, and many different observations can get observed in a single night. Uh, this is opposed to what's known as classical observing, where a single astronomer is granted, say, a single night. The astronomer will say, all right, my night is August 28th. They'd come to Hawaii, they'd get ready to go, and if the weather's good, then they get their data. If the weather is bad and they get nothing, they go home with nothing. And, that's, and then they have to apply for more time next year. And so it's very difficult to get high priority things, important things in this old classical mode. In this, this mode now, we can do astronomers for our observations for astronomers, uh, you know, whenever it's most convenient, if they're highly ranked, whenever it's best for them. We can also do multiple observations for multiple astronomers over the course of a single night. So it allows far more flexibility. So this is what a normal plan, this is a, a screenshot from our Q planning software right here. In the middle there, there's a lot going on I know, but what to focus on is the little blocks in the middle, the uh, blue and green uh, blocks. And you can see, if you look, there's a little red dashed line on each side, eight degree evening twilight, eight degree morning twilight, that's the entire night. And every little block there is an observation, a different target we're looking at. If you counted them up, there's about 37 targets in this plan here. And so that's 37 different programs, 37 different things that we're doing over the course of a single night. Whereas in classical mode, you'd have one thing to do that night. And if the weather's bad, you don't get it. Whereas in this mode, uh, we can do many things over the course of a single evening. And that's the power of this mode. So after the Q coordinator has created the plan for the night, this is where the neural observer comes in. This is where um, I come into the picture. So I will get that plan and I will execute that plan over the course of the night. Whatever weather conditions that we're getting, I'll try to optimize our observations for the weather we're provided. And then we'll try to get the best data possible and do this according to the specifications, the astronomer whose program is being observed. As I mentioned in that database, we'll, they go in and they say what they want. They'll also describe how they are, you know, what their maximum constraints are, kind of what's the, the worst conditions they can tolerate and then we do our best to make sure they get at least that. And if we can't, then we'll move on to something else. And once observed, the data products can then be downloaded by the astronomer over the internet. As I mentioned, they don't ever have to come down here, don't have to come to CFHT. They can simply, they will quite literally get an email that says your data is available for download. And so feel free to take a look at it and use it uh, as you see fit to conduct uh, your science. And so it can all be done uh, without them being involved at all. And so we've answered a few of these questions as to why we do it like this, why key service observing, but it's highly efficient. You know, observers such as myself, we, you know, we essentially do this all the time. We're an astronomer who just comes from somewhere overseas, may not know the optimal way to operate the observatory. And so they may not be able to get as much done as someone who does it all the time can. Um, we can also give high priority to important projects you know, in the classical mode, if you if your night if you're weathered out, you have bad weather for your night, you don't get any data at all. In this way, we can rank projects highly, and then if we have a bad weather night, we can just schedule them again for the next night. We can keep trying, keep trying, keep trying until we get those high priority observations. And then once we do, then we can move on to lower priority things. So this mode allows us to always get the best science return we can, which is good for our astronomers. It's good for the scientific community in general, and it's good for the observatory, right? We want to produce the best science we can, and in this way, that allows us to uh, achieve that goal. 
And we also do highly kind constrained observations or very short observations. And so if, say, if we want to look at exoplanet transit, for example, that happens at a very specific time, right? A planet passes in front of its star at a particular moment. And so we can get ready and we can schedule that. We can plan our uh, observations around that, uh, that uh, transit, which is may not be possible if you, know, you get assigned a night that doesn't have a, tra a transit on it in a classical way of doing things. And we can also quickly react to unexpected or transient events. Let's say a gamma ray burst goes off, or what we've done recently actually is uh, the BA, uh, a gravitational wave event will occur. We can kind of quickly react and stop what we're doing and go over there and, and try to see if there's a, some sort of uh, uh, light counterpart to that gravitational wave event. And so this mode allows us to react quickly to these things that may happen unexpectedly. And that allows us to we call these targets of opportunity. So uh, with that in mind, some, a few of uh, the signs we do at CFH2, deep wide field surveys with those wide field imagers. This is one kind of the, one of the bread and butter things that we do. Uh, CFHD and that MegaCamp instrument in particular is optimized for what's known as the U-band. This is a very blue, borderline, bordering on ultraviolet side of things. And CFHD's camera, MegaCam, is one of the only cameras um, that exists that is optimized for this U-band. And so even though we are a smaller observatory, we have this special capability in that we can observe very, very high frequency uh, optical light. And so we can do these large surveys in U-band that other facilities can't do. Uh, we also do uh, near asteroid tracking, so-called planetary defense work. Um, there's also telescopes over on Maui that uh, do this. And so we will do follow-ups with them. And so e almost every night that we have uh, that may camp instrument on, we're doing near Earth asteroid tracking and follow-ups to follow to figure out the precise orbits of these objects and figure out if they are potentially a threat to uh, Earth. Uh, we've also done the Kuiper Belt object hunting, uh, programs that look for objects deep in the solar system. Uh, we've also done uh, looking for moons around Saturn is a recent program we had as well. Um, as I mentioned, exoplanet transits, we do that with Spiru. That's one of the biggest things we do with that instrument, looking, watching for new planets and uh, looking for them as well. Uh, uh, Spiru is also uh, optimized for high precision radio velocity. This simply means we can detect how a star is, um, it's essentially its movement uh, relative to uh, relative to Earth, and so and, and we can see how how seeing how a star moves means you can detect if there are um, planets orbiting that star as well, and so you can kind of the star will basically it'll wobble uh, in its radial velocity if there's a uh, the gra uh, gravity of a planet is pulling on that star, and so Spirio is optimized for these high precision radial velocity measurements, and so it does hunts for planets in this way as well. Uh, we can do extragalactic star formation with Satel. Uh, it looks for you know how H2 regions and galaxies, how they form and uh, how they're evolving and changing with time. I mentioned the gravitational wave event follow-ups as well. And uh, brown dwarf studies, we look at brown dwarfs because we look at infrared bands, we can see brown dwarfs and follow up how they move uh, and much more. The image you're looking at right now is uh, actually a really special image. This, this image uh, is, a different, a different type of science as well. This was taken um, as a navigational image for the New Horizons spacecraft. And, uh, and so this image was sent to, uh, in, it was an image taken in the direction New Horizons was going. This image was then sent uh, to the New Horizons team to help them conduct uh, spacecraft navigation and help them correct trajectories uh, for their uh, spacecraft. And so we've done things like that as well. That's more unusual, um, but we have done things like that uh, as well. Um, and so uh, with that, we've come uh, to the end of uh, things here. I know we're gone a little bit long, so I hope you all be able to stick with us here. Um, so we've gone through how I got here. We've gone through why is here exist. And we looked at uh, what we actually do here. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, I just want to thank everyone for being here. And, you know, it's been great to, be able to talk to you about what I've done and what I do. And um, open things up to uh, questions here. All right, so we've got a couple questions uh, from just throughout the presentation, but we got one from Peter Jedeke, um, where he says, I'd like to hear more details about how you operate the telescope. What kind of functions does this involve? What actually happens when a command is issued remotely? And how is the data gathered, stored, and distributed? So a couple questions there, but... Uh, um, sure, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so I pulled it up so I can see that here too. So uh, basically it's, it's all done uh, via computers. And so if I am in the, uh, you know, we have a, a control room in Waimea in our headquarters facility, which is far removed from the summit. And there's a, a computer system called the, uh, there's two systems, one called the telescope control system and one called the observatory automation project. And so these are all, uh, basically they have control over the physical uh, building systems at the observatory. Uh, and so I can do, you know, everything from moving the telescope remotely to literally turning the lights on and off in the building. These are all controlled by the, uh, the computer. And so I can simply press a button on a computer screen and control these things. Uh, so it's all, it's basically it's over the internet. It's all done through specialized computers that are, can control these physical systems. Um, you know, on a more technical level, there's things like PLCs that can respond to this. They're all done, you know, internet connected uh, electrical controllers that can turn things off and on and move things, but it's all done computer. You know, you can think of it analogous to um, a flyby wire on a plane or in a car. It's all, it's all basically a computer does everything. I just tell the computer what I want and then the computer does it. Um, there is, uh, when a command is issued remotely, um, we have a direct interface, a kind of a, a, a terminal, if you're familiar well with the terminal on a computer, I basically have a terminal command line interface to the instrument itself on the telescope. And I can just type in that command line and tell the instrument what to do. And the instrument will do, do exactly what I want. We also have graphical interfaces uh, that allow me to do that as well. So I don't have to type in commands. I can just click on say a particular observation and it appears graphically in our, we call an observing tool. And I can, I can click execute on that, on that basically a little, appears like a little uh, block, execute, and then the computer knows all the commands necessary to execute that block and it'll observe it uh, for me. Once the data is gathered, um, it's, we have a high, um, a high speed internet link, uh, which is it's stored on servers locally at the summit, at the telescope itself. It's also immediately copied to our servers in Waimea. And then um, it's also copied to the Canadian Astronom Astronomy Data Center. Some of you may be familiar with that facility in Victoria. It's one of Canada's biggest contributions to CFHT. Um, all CFHT data is backed up to that data center. And um, I told you we have the, the link that astronomers get to look to get their data. That link is a link to the Canadian Astronomy Data Center in Victoria. So all CFHT, all CFHT data goes to CADC in Victoria. And then astronomers from around the world would download the data from CADC. And so it's, you know, it's one of Canada's biggest roles Canada plays in, uh, and, 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 and that data is not, it's proprietary for about a year. And uh, after a year, it's available to the public. And so any of you can go to the CADC and download CFH data if you wanna look at it. It's all available to be downloaded if you wanna see it. You can't get data from the last year, that's still proprietary so to allow astronomers time to Kind of get their science out, um, but after a year, anyone can go download. It's all public. You know, we are partially funded by the government of Canada, and so the data we provide is publicly available. That's that's really interesting. I was going to ask about that whether or not the data was that like available to people. Um, there's another follow-up question I did want to ask related to this too, um, and so you'll stop had... screen sharing here. Is that okay? Yeah. 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 Um, because you mentioned um, command lines, and uh, I just wanted to know how much code do you need to know for your job? Um, and did you study computer science or robotics? And do you think these fields would be helpful for those who are getting into astronomy today? Um, I, I didn't. So I didn't do a ton of. Uh, I did not do a ton of computer science. To be honest, I going into this position, that was I would I, I was you know you asked in an interview what's your biggest weakness, and I remember saying that was my biggest weakness, was my uh, computer science uh, knowledge. Effectively, um, a lot of that was done kind of on the job training, and you know we were trained extensively. But you know before I had my first night solo operating the telescope, there was probably three months of training on how to do it by other observers and and whatnot. So. Most of that stuff was done uh, on the job and you learn a lot. Um, and I still, every day, I it just actually guess yesterday, I was on a, a little Zoom chat with one of our astronomers um, asking her how to do some data reduction stuff with some of the software because that's still not really my expertise. Um, there's a lot I just learned um, on the job. 
but uh, you're basically you're, you're trained extensively in how to do things. And so you're, you learn as you go, but I didn't have a huge background going into this. Thank you. That's great. Um, Eric, what else do we have? Well, we've got a couple others. Uh, we got one from Janine McGillivray. Um, hi, Janine. Uh, are other graduates, any Canadians or others from UHH astronomy working in astronomy in Hawaii? Um, certainly. So uh, I mentioned there was four observers at CFHT. One of our other observers is a UHT graduate as well. Um, as, and there's also, uh, we have probably, I think, I think at CFHT, there's probably at least a dozen staff members that uh, attended school here in Hawaii. And so we do have, we, you know, when they, you know, apply for a job, it's open to anyone to apply, but there is definitely, you know, weight given to people who have attended school uh, in Hawaii. You know, we like to hire local people, like everybody does. Um, in terms of other Canadians, certainly at uh, CFHT, there is a number of Canadians. Uh, the uh, every agency, Canada, France, and Hawaii, will uh, staff astronomer positions at CFHT. So both France and Canada have three astronomers stationed at CFHT at pretty well all times. And so we have three astronomers who are Canadians at uh, CFHT. Uh, we also have a couple engineers who are Canadians uh, as well. And so it's definitely not, definitely not the only uh, Canadian at, at CFHT, um, but I'm kind of the, I'm the only one that kind of, uh, I guess, attended school uh, in Hawaii as well. So I have a unique position in that, but Certainly, we've hired people from, from Canada, we've hired people from go to school, uh, and hired people from all over the place. Awesome. So there's, there's a couple other ones. Um, I got one from Kareem Jaffer. Hey, Kareem. Uh, do you get chances to be outside stargazing at Mount Akea? Uh, it's hard sometimes to see when you're doing professional astronomy. Yeah, <laughs> certainly. Yeah, and I mean, this might come across as maybe uh, almost sacrilegious to some folks here, but uh, certainly I find that in a lot of ways, astronomy is my job. And so I have different hobbies than astronomy. Um, I still love to go outside and do stargazing, like for example, Comet Neowise, you know, I had to go and see that when that was up in the sky. Um, but I find that personally, I don't go out and stargaze kind of on my own very often. Um, if a friend's up and want to go out or see a meteor shower or something like that, I'm happy to take them out and point out constellations and all that kind of stuff. But um, for the most part, I, you know, I do astronomy at work and I do other things on my own time. So I, though I, you know, it's like I said, maybe a little bit sacrilegious, but that's just the honest truth. Yeah. I have an anonymous question here. Um, it's from anonymous attendee. Uh, how can you be sure you have identified all the volcanoes on other planets to be able to compare with Mauna Kea? Well, I guess I can't. I can't be sure. I'm definitely relying on what uh, you know. The uh, like that, that 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 information came from uh, you know NASA information. So they've done you know radar maps and stuff of you know a lot for the or the uh, satellites and orb orbiters around other planets. And so they've kind of done topological maps of some of these other bodies, and they can give fairly uh, you know fairly accurate elevation estimates for some of the features on these bodies. But certainly, absolutely, you know, the, for bodies we haven't explored. Um, it's very difficult to know, but for, you know, the, the inner rocky planets, um, you know, Mercury, Mars, Venus, the other planets that have mountains, quote unquote, um, you know, I guess I'm fairly confident that I, I, that that's right, but I am trusting NASA when they say that the heights of these mountains are what they are. Yeah. So there's, there's a, a question regarding a, um, a photo in one of your slides, actually, and I believe it was in, in the room where you're actually doing the astronomy. Uh, but the question is from Luca, and the question is, what do you use the binoculars on the desk for? Uh, I'm guessing, was that must be one of the ones I was in the control room, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and so the binoculars, uh, so that, that picture is actually when we're up at the summit, um, so that was a night we we're doing summit observing. And so binoculars are useful if we think we have weather um, incoming, it's useful just to go outside and see if there, if that, is that a fog bank approaching? Is that, um, is it look like, you know, there's something happening that they want to be aware of, mostly for fog and, and clouds that are approaching the summit. 
And so it's sometimes easier to get a ceiling that's from far away, obviously, with the binoculars. And so when you're, the advantage of being at the summit versus being remote is that you can actually just go outside and look at what the conditions are, versus when we're operating remotely, we have to rely on sensors and low light cameras and whatnot. But there's no substitute for your eyes in a lot of senses, in a lot of regards. So that's what those binoculars are for. Yeah. Uh, Alendria, feel free to you know cut me off if I just start quick firing these questions out. By the way, like, this is uh, okay. Yeah, great. Doing it. All right. So uh, this one's from Nicholas David. How many of the telescope's instruments can operate simultaneously? Oh, that's that's a great question. And probably something I should have mentioned when I talked about the instruments. So. The answer is one. And so we can do uh, only one instrument at a time. And that is adds part of that adds to uh, the uh, scheduling complexity. So I talked about um, you know, a little bit how we schedule things. And, and uh, so at any, on any given night, there'll be one instrument that is on the telescope. At the beginning of each semester, um, our director of science will look through all of the uh, programs that have been accepted for the semester. And he'll make an instrument schedule based on what needs to be observed. So this instrument needs to go on for these nights, a different instrument will go on for these other nights, and they'll try to maximize the, the, uh, all the amount of data we can get for all programs across all the instruments. It takes about one, but it takes around eight hours or so to swap instruments out, um, and especially for instance, they're up at prime focus. So instruments that are at the top of the telescope. And so there'll be a big crane will go up and it'll lift the, uh, instrument off the telescope, put it on the ground and put the other one back on top of the telescope. And so the instrument swap and then uh, you can observe that new instrument. The instrument runs will last, uh, but usually between five and 14 uh, nights. Now two weeks is the longest we'll go uh, with one instrument. And that's simply because um, of the phase of the moon. And so the optical instruments like uh, Megacam and Satel, uh, you know, the brightness of the sky changes dramatically depending on the phase of the moon. And so these optical instruments, we don't want to have them on the telescope during uh, the, you know, kind of between the full, a week and a week before and a week after a full moon, simply because the sky is so bright that it washes out kind of all the detail you want to see. Uh, your sky background, what we call it, is so much higher in those times. And so we don't want this on the telescope. And so we'll put the optical instruments on during phase, dark phases of the moon and keep the infrared instruments on during bright moon time because in the infrared sky, it's very, uh, I guess it's much less affected by the brightness of the moon in the, in the uh, infrared bands. And so that's, we saw back and forth depending on the phase of the moon. And we have to decide that what, which one gets chosen and gets decided based on how many proposals we've uh, received over the course of the, uh, and how many science needs to be done on each instrument individually. Awesome. And uh, so in the, in the questions, there's actually a really nice message from Janine just saying, uh, relaying this email from the mayor of Nanaimo. Great to hear about Cam's presentation today. Only wish I could watch it. Sounds like a bit of a dream career, I must say. Oh, well, <laughs> well, that's a, I didn't know he'd, he'd be aware of it, but I'm, you know, I'm glad. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Krog seems like a nice guy. <laughs> so I'm glad <laughs> yeah. And I know that's not technically a question, but I thought it was nice, so I would share it with you. Um, yeah. Okay, so here's one from Bruce, um, and it's uh, Cam. Do you observe with an amateur telescope in your spare time? Um, I guess I personally I don't personally own a telescope. CFHD has what's called an outreach telescope, and so we do a lot of uh, going around to. I guess well, this is obviously this is all pre-coronavirus, but before all that, we would go around to um, go into different schools and public events and take our telescope to give uh, students, particularly kids, a chance to uh, look through the telescope and see different things. And so um, generally when I, I, I don't do it myself, but we do a, a huge amount of outreach going to visit schools and talk to kids and often schools around here will have um, so-called science nights where they'll, you know, they'll have people from, uh, in the astronomy community, they'll have people from um, the marine science community and people from engineering things. So out of all different science that happens on the big island here, will come to the school and talk about the different science they do. And one of the things we do um, with that is we'll take a telescope and you know point at stuff to have the kids see it and and whatnot. And uh, and so I don't do that personally, but a lot of the time is spent doing these kind of more outreach events with, at schools and also at um, sometimes public groups will ask us to come by and talk about it as well. So 
it's more more done on that regard. Awesome. And so there's a couple questions from Tom Vassos. Um, one of them is, do you worry about hackers gaining remote access? Are you aware of any incidents at CFHT or other remote telescopes? Um, well, I guess there's two, two ways to, to look at that. I, I mean, if, it, if the question is gaining remote access to like move the telescope, um, I guess theoretically it is possible they could gain access, but to be honest, the system is so, it's so complex that without any kind of training, I don't think you could really do much to, and, it would, and, and there's also a lot of safe software interlocks. And so the software is not gonna let you do anything that will physically damage anything. And so, you know, if, if you got in and tried to move the telescope around, yeah, you can maybe move it around if you even got that far, but you couldn't do anything that the telescope wasn't capable of doing. And so like, you're not, yeah, maybe moving around and, and whatnot, but, and we also have kind of a, a lockout button. And so, you know, there's this, in the control room, there's this called the uh, emergency shutoff button and I can press it and it will essentially sever all the um, connections to um, all the, kind of shut down all the, all the connections to this computer, the control server. And so then everything will just stop in its tracks. And so there's kind of emergency override. Um, if the question is more along the lines of data security for data that astronomers have gathered, there's certainly, that's maybe more common in, um, in that, I mean, I shouldn't say more common, but more likely, more possible in that someone could gain access to the data repositories that contain the proprietary astronomical data. Um, again, it's theoretically possible, but um, I guess it, it's, it would be bad if someone scooped you for your science you've done, but that's, that's kind of the worst case scenario, right? It's not gonna be a, a health and safety issue if someone scoops your data. It would be bad, we don't, we, don't want, we don't want that to happen and we do our best to protect that. Everything is password protected and CADC, you have to have a login and stuff, proprietary, it's all kind of protected in our normal way of protecting online data. Um, so, I, but I guess it is possible, but there's, it's not, it wouldn't be a, a health and safety issue, I guess. And, and I'm not aware of any incidents that have happened at CFHD or um, anywhere else in that, in that regard. Astronomers are all pretty, uh, they're pretty, a pretty, uh, I guess, honest bunch. So I can't, I can't imagine them doing that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> no telescopes going rogue then, that's good. Um, no. So we have a couple more questions. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna try and get through them as fast as I can, because I don't wanna keep you, keep you late, but we got Dennis Frost and he's asking you, uh, is there an electromechanical team that keeps the machinery working or are contractors used? Yes, there absolutely is. And so I, I mentioned off the top near the very beginning um, that about only about 10 to 15% of jobs are kind of ast astronomer jobs. So at CFHD, we have a staff of around, I think about 46 people right now on CFHD staff. And they're divided into four groups. We have the astronomy group, which includes the astronomers, the observers like myself, and people who work in that QSO mode to help us plan the observations. Um, we also have a, what we call a software group. We have a instrumentation group and an operations group. And so, you know, the astronomy is only a quarter of the observatory at best, right? Um, it's, also, it's also an administration team that handles the administration, making sure that the office is cleaned and that we all get paid and all that kind of stuff too, right? So um, is that side of things, but we absolutely have an in-house team that main, does all of our maintenance for us. They maintain the facilities, they maintain the telescope itself. Um, and then we have an instrumentation team, which takes care of just the instruments themselves because these are you know, highly complex instruments and most, they're all one of a kind, right? There's only one megacam, it's only one Satel. And so maintenance on those is a full-time job for an entire team of engineers. And so their engineers, they look after the instruments for us. We have technicians uh, that, you know, who look after the hydraulic systems. We have a, you know, in-house electrician. We have an in-house auto mechanic. We have, you know, people that maintain all of our, you know, our uh, facilities guy who makes sure that the roof doesn't leak and all that kind of stuff. These are all done in-house. For some specialty things we do get contractors for, um, for example, if to service our, you know, our H HVAC systems or whatnot, or to service our crane, we don't have a crane service technician, a certified crane technician. We bring people in for that. Generally, we bring in contractors for things that are, um, uh, they're mandated by the state. So if you have to have some sort of state certification to do something, um, then we don't often have someone who has a particular, you know, like an elevator repair technician has to be certified for that. 
we'll bring a contractor for that. But for all the basic uh, maintenance and whatnot, those are all done by our in-house team, by uh, uh, by people who work at CFHT, which, which which you know just drives home the point that working at an observatory is not about just astronomers and people who do astronomy. The vast majority of staff are not astronomers who don't work in astronomy. You know, they could be an accountant, an admin assistant, a finance officer, you know, to, you know, I said, auto techs, engineers and whatnot. So it's a vast spectrum in an observatory. It's not just astronomers. Um, maybe there's room for a communications coordinator. Um, yes, <laughs> we, have an out, we have an outreach manager. <laughs> yeah. uh, worth a shot. Oh, <laughs> what would you say are the biggest discoveries made by CFHT? Uh, that, you know, that's a, that's a difficult question because we have been operating for 40 years and so it's hard to go back that long, but um, certainly some of the, I can talk about the ones, the more recent ones that I've been uh, involved in and that has been um, things like uh, the, the Oumuamua, the interstellar asteroid that passed through the solar system. So um, that was discovered by a telescope over on, uh, on, on Haleakala on Maui. That's the same telescope that we do uh, uh, follow-ups for the asteroid follow-ups. And so it appeared to them as just another asteroid follow-up that they wanted us to look at. Once we got more data on that asteroid, that it became clear that this was not on a, uh, a normal orbit. It was on a hyperbolic orbit, meaning that it would leave the solar system. It came from somewhere that was outside the solar system and it would leave uh, the solar system again. Um, and so the discovery of that object was, you know, for having CFHG taking some of the first images of that uh, was super exciting. Um, so, you know, that recently that one comes to mind. Um, we also had uh, a new uh, dwarf planet, which I'm trying to think of the designation. I think it might have been RR245, but don't quote me on that. But that came out with one of our, our surveys who looks for icy bodies. They discovered that new dwarf planet. And that was pretty cool to be a part of that. Um, you know, thing, and of course, doing when now that Spiru is here, this new instrument we got a couple years ago that looked for exoplanet transits. Um, you know, we're constantly following up on, with exoplanets, and every night with that instrument, we monitor um, stars for uh, the, the radio velocity variations. And so, uh, you know, there, we anticipate in the future being able to publish um, the fact all these new planets that have been discovered at CFHT. Um, and following up on those and refining their orbits and that kind of thing. So um, those are some of the recent things we've been involved in. You know, like I said, it goes back 40 years. So it's hard to say the biggest things we've been involved in. Um, but recently, those are some of the big things that I can, that I personally have experienced. Okay, so we've only got a handful of questions left. Uh, this one just came in from Gregory. Uh, Cam, will your position and role at CFHT be impacted by the renovation plans for the telescope? Um, and then Brack says MSC. Uh, hopefully, yeah. it won't be run by robots. Great talk. Yeah. <laughs> well, th oh, thanks, Greg. So, Greg is the professor at VIU that uh, inspired me there. So, I'm glad he's able to tune in for this. It's great to see you, Greg. Um, so, uh, it potentially it, it may be. So, um, just a little bit of a backstory here. So, you know, I mentioned CFHG is 40 years old. We do still do cutting edge science, but you know, that can only kind of go on for so long. Eventually, you know, these, this facility will be, um, it'll need to be re 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 replaced. And so the plan is to re replace it with something called the uh, Mauna Kea Spectroscopic Explorer, which will be a facility that does um, spectroscope, just solely spectroscopic observations. So looking at individual stars, but it'll be able to do um, quite literally thousands of stars at a time. So you can look at thousands of stars all at once and can, you can get spectra from all of these, all of these stars. Um, so that is the plan, and, and that's been the plan for um, later in this decade, in the 2020s decade. Um, so there's a tent, obviously, while they, they have to have to deconstruct the telescope for that and then rebuild it basically from about you know the halfway point, and kind of everything below the telescope will remain, everything telescope and above will have to be rebuilt. Um, so there is a potential, and during that time, I guess they won't need telescope operators. Um, so there may be a, a lull in that on that side of things. Um, although I, I didn't mention this in my talk, I talked about being a remote observer. Although my role at CFHT is actually going to be changing in the next few months, so my position will be I'll be moving to a slightly different position, a more technical position, where I won't be doing quite as much observing. I'll be doing a little bit more uh, managing the technical aspects and being a, 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 the technical lead on terms of issues that happen during observing, 
And so potentially in the future, because my role is shifting over the next few months, I may be able to then transition more to a role that uh, will be useful during the transition process between CFHT and MSC. Um, but that remains to be seen. And MSC, in a sense, is still kind of an aspirational plan in a sense, in that it's not, by no means is it kind of fully funded. We don't have money to do this yet. We're hoping that uh, on, the, on the next decadal surveys, when the Canadian and US and French astronomy communities um, kind of put through their priorities for what they want to see funded over the next decade, then MSC will rank highly in, the, in those rankings. And then we'll be able to get some funding for that uh, to do it that way. If we don't get a high ranking in those surveys, it's honestly hard to see how MSC will move forward. Um, so we're waiting to see how those rankings play out in the next few years. All right, and this one's from Mike. Um, it's, uh, is it possible to visit the site? And so I, I'm assuming he's referring to the actual site where you are doing your work. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess, you know, in a, in a non-coronavirus world, you know, we'll, we'll base everything off that. Obviously, you know, right now there's a, in, a quarantine and whatnot. If you come here, you have to quarantine in it for two weeks and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, but beyond that, you know, if it's looking at, you know, kind of the normal way things are, it is, it is possible. Um, the road up Mount Akea is a public road. Like you can just drive up there. You know, it does require a four by four. It's, it's a, a switchback mountain road. It's not something that should be taken, you know, not an excursion that should be taken lightly, for example, but traveling to the summit of Mount Akea is, it's open, it's, it's a public place. You, you know, you're not gonna, no one's gonna say you can't go up there. Um, having access to the observatories is different. They are, you know, they're not open to the public facilities. They're, um, that being said, a lot of, we do a lot of tours and stuff like that for people. Um, and so, and some observatories, like for example, the Keck Observatory has a public viewing area with at the summit. So you can walk in and, a little, you know, a little room with a glass windows, you can look in at the telescope and see it um, up there on the summit. So, you know, the, they're, not, they're not public facilities, but you can travel there and see them. And uh, if you contact these observatories ahead of time, it is often possible to arrange a tour or they'll tell you kind of how best to, to see the telescopes if, you, if you're more, inter more interested in that regard. Awesome. And this last question is from Tim and it's, uh, it's Pam. What? exactly did you do at the planetarium at the Imaloa Astronomy Center? Right. <laughs> so uh, at Imaloa, uh, if I'm trying to remember, I think my, my job title there was, kind of had all the buzzwords. I was the planetarium support facilitator and technician. So <laughs> but again, like a remote observer, that tells you nothing about what I actually did. Um, and so basically what that meant though, is that I would kind of look after the day-to-day -day happenings of the planetarium. And so, you know, every day we had a show schedule, um, we needed to conduct the shows. And so I would, you know, for, we had also had, a, I worked with a couple of the people that would run the shows. I would also host um, a couple of the shows, particularly a live, we had used to do a live show where we would, you know, talk about the sky and whatnot. Um, and so I would do those and I'd also make sure that we'd have speakers come in not unlike this, actually myself, where someone would come in from observatory or elsewhere and talk about what they did, these, these speaker series. So managing the speaker series. Um, I would also you know, just make sure that the planetarium was, you know, if the, if the, if the, when the projectors broke or something like that, I would order the light bulbs and get that fixed and whatnot. So, I, you know, the short answer, I guess, is uh, that I would kind of just manage the day-to-day -day operations of the planetarium. Awesome. Thank you. I think, that, All right. I think that looks like that's it for questions. Um, I guess I would have one last one that I'll add. Um, what other, and I think you've touched upon it, but I'll just ask it flat out. Like, so what other job, um, the, basically the, the robot bit, like you said that your job, you've had one job where you've been replaced by a robot. What's the next job? Yeah. You know, how do you prevent well, yourself from being replaced by a robot? And how next are you going to be replaced by a robot? Well, <laughs> that's a good, you know, it's funny you ask. Like, uh, to, be, to be quite honest, like this telescope operator position in, in some observatories is it is done autonomously. So there are observatories that um, are that do do this. Um, you know, they don't have a telescope yeah. operator. They'll, they'll simply input the plan for the night and say, this is what I want you to do, take images on these places. And the telescope will just do that. That really, though, depends on 
what kind of science you're trying to accomplish. And so if you're like, for example, that uh, I've said a couple, mentioned a couple of times, the telescope on Maui that does the asteroid searches. So that one is autonomous, it is robotic in that they'll say, I wanna search this part of the sky for things that move. And so it'll look at this swath of the sky and then an hour later go back and look at that same swath of the sky again and then compare the images and see if there's anything that's moved between those images. So if you're doing kind of blind observations like that, where you're just kind of taking images and seeing what's there, it's pretty easy for a robot to do that kind of stuff. Right, but if, if you're doing some sort of thing where you need need to, you know, look at a particular star and you don't know if that star is a binary star or if there's some sort of object there or you don't know quite where that star is if it's if it has a higher proper motion if it moves quickly relative to other other stars so its position is slightly unknown, or if there's some sort of you need to be there at a particular time some and some of those regards it's still a computer still can't make the best determination on what to do, and so. The, the, you know, the, it, come, it comes down to a human to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and so it may become that human operators become a more of a niche role in terms of telescope where they, they're needed for uh, you know, particular tasks and they, uh, robots do other things. But uh, for now, anyway, it seems likely that um, we'll need human, human operators for the foreseeable future. Um, but you know, that's, the computers get better and better all the time. So I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't, I can definitely envision a future where uh, it's all, all the observing is done autonomously. Well, I'm glad to hear that there's still a use for humanity. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so am I. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, so I guess if it's okay, if um, I will just wrap everything up. I really wanted to thank you for coming out here. This has been, well, coming out here uh, to the internet um, and yeah. for sharing your story of how you uh I, you know metaphorically or physically even climbed a mountain to get more uh data about the stars and work in the field of astronomy um and um my thanks as well to eric for monitoring the chat and the questions and i'd like to give a special thanks to the audience and thanks to everyone it's it's wonderful to see some people from nanaimo i spent quite a few years um on gabriola well summers on gabriola island and so i've got some very warm memories of nanaimo and it's great to see right. everybody out yeah. here um and so yeah so well, thank yeah, yeah thanks to everyone for joining us here on uh, this speaker series, and I wish you all clear skies and great stargazing. Yes, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Leanne. Yeah, thank you for the RISC for having me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you all, and and uh, yeah, I'm sure it's, it's been a lot of fun. So thanks to them, and thank you all for joining us here today. Okay, wonderful. Thanks.